Ladies and gentlemen, uh, next to me, a very, a very experienced from Chamber of Commerce, from the university principal, and also uh, from the uh, professors or lecturers. So I just want to introduce myself. Actually, uh, I'm teaching also in Tongji University, Shanghai, um, but as a guest professor. I'm a not a full professor because I come from, uh, I came from industry, BNSF. I used to work for a big chemical company. And by the way, we have also, I think, in New Jersey, uh, where we have a big office there, right? <laughs> I visited that, that place before. Um, yes, to my uh, personal uh, confrontation, or let's say in my prof professional life, actually I started as a chemical engineer. Uh, I studied in Germany. Before that, I was in Taiwan, and I started in Germany, and I was amazed of the dual uh, education system in Germany, actually. I am very much uh, happy uh, or appreciate there is a, such a chance that you can have actually a, a Realschule, that means uh, more professional, and the other one is the Gymnasium, that is the uh, uh, university uh, curriculum. And I do meet some of my uh, uh, doctor uh, friends in BNSF. They started actually from the professional side, skill side, and then at the end, they find they feel much uh, comfortable doing doctor degrees and uh, even doing research. So Germany has that kind of uh, binary possibilities. Basically, you have this uh, dual assistance, but you still can swap to and fro. But that is normally not happening in China, for example. There's no chance that you can swap. Once you are in this line, then you are in this line. It, you can't change that anymore. So you are. If you are doing the professional things, you are, you are saying goodbye to doctors. You are, you are never get a doctor degree. That's China. Um, what I'm trying to do that here is, <coughs> no matter how we do the uh, uh, dual education or education, to me, I think each individual is different. So this is number one. And secondly, is each individual develops different differently. So education is still about a holistic person. It doesn't matter whether uh, he or she is trained in the first place on the skill side, because we do see that uh, children have a little bit different tendency, more unskillful uh, 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 skills, or on the uh, logic thinking to my children. I have uh, two daughters, and uh, really that they have a difference between individual. Uh, but still, what you need is actually to create or even build a holistic person. Totality. I don't know how to use that word, but I will show. Try, I try to show that. And the question is, how to do that? I'm skipping all this. I just try to uh, use a yin and yang in Chinese and try to show that basically uh, we are not. Uh, focusing on any kind of uh, process or individual elements. Actually, the whole five elements, or uh, let's say in the, in the human beings, it comes up with your age, with your, your, your experience, etc. Et you're you are actually living through uh, five elements. So I just take one thing. Maybe we start with number one is the imitation, because we start always with the imitation. Let me see. It goes up. Imitation. Imitation, you imitate everything. You start from young or small as a child. Once you do that, actually, it's a, a, a kind of water element. So that helps to go on learning. Learning is like a wood. You have a certain system. Wood, stem, and then you have branch, and that's the wood. Then it goes to teach. Teach is like a fire. Basically, you have to do this, and you are going into that direction, and they are also the teacher is energetic. They want you to learn anything, everything. Now, yeah, the assisting part is actually, or in, in, in uh, the transforma transforming, we can call that also, is coaching. Coaching is like earth. And innovation or creation, 
That is metal. So if I say that every one element is transforming, so from imitation, transform to learn, transform to teach, coach, and creation or innovation. So now if you see that there is always assisting something and control something. So what is controlling what? You see that if I start with a fire, who is controlling the fire? Fire is teach. Who is controlling teach? That is water. Water is extinguishing fire. And imitation is actually controlling teach. So you try to teach, but you just imitate. So or, uh, on the other hand, when you are teaching, so and uh, the best thing actually you do is you just imitate me. Just repeat after me, repeat after me. So the teacher will say that, repeat after me. And you can say that who is controlling uh, the, uh, from the fire is controlling the, the, the metal, that means the fire will melt the, the metal. So basically if you have too much teach, you're controlling the creation, innovation. So that gives you the five elements. Basically every human being is going through these five elements. Doesn't matter whether you are coming from skills or you're coming from logic thinking. This is what I'm trying to say. To me, dual education is everywhere. Uh, I'm 65 today. After B BASF, I started actually doing not only chemicals. Nowadays, I'm teaching a little bit in the university, one third of my time, and one third of time, I'm still using my capability in the chemical industries. So I'm doing some consulting. And uh, the last one, so this is actually interesting, which is five elements. Five elements is what I learned from Chinese medicine. And this is what I have learned actually in the last 10 years. So why we try to do this at all? Basically, when we say yin yang, yin yang, I would like to introduce to you yin yang itself, it doesn't have an ending. So it's a dynamic balance, which means you're thinking that we have a yin and a yang. So either this side or that side. Either I am in the professional skills or I am in the logic, you know, the uh, doctor degree and all this uh, research. It's not true. Basically, you have to have a kind of crossing and as a dynamic balance. Once I am doing a uh, master degree or doctor degree, I need an internship to learn what is the practical things. On the other hand, when I am doing permanently with uh, practical issues, then I'm trying to improve my uh, logic thinking or trying to anal 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 analysis. So yin and yang is never itself. It is always containing the other half. And that is always there. And with the within this yin and yang going uh, uh, to and forth, there are five elements flowing through. So I'm just trying to start with my presentation, a short introduction of Chinese thinking. But I think that is relevant also to the worldwide and also to the dual education. Thank you. Okay, so the second one, we would like to have uh, the Sue. I think Sue, Sue, would you please? Thank you very much. Um, while they're getting started, I was trying to figure out why they asked me to do a presentation in this section. And uh, after meeting uh, Gary this summer and telling him a little bit about my past, I started my career teaching high school, which I did for 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> Coached gymnastics, you know, did the cheerleaders, but I mm -hmm. set up the AP calculus program, did everything from teaching students who were going to go work in the local uh, grocery store uh, to students who were going to go on to Georgia Tech and become engineers or go on and become doctors. And one of the things I noticed when I moved from teaching high school to teaching in a community college is that the expectations of teaching were different. In other words, expectations on the students were different. And yet, as I finally tell my faculty, there's only an eight week difference from the day they step out of the high school and the moment they step on the college campus. And if we think over eight weeks, they're suddenly gonna learn how to be independent learners, we're fooling ourselves. So the, the hypothesis behind this, or the purpose of this presentation is to talk about what we need to be doing to ensuring that those that are sitting at the front of the classroom, whether they're high school teachers, the college teachers, the internship, the businesses, 
is that we're helping the students move through, the, through that continuum of learning, because I think it's very important. So, um, where's my Deepa teacher? Thanks. So let me start with a little bit. This is the United States. Um, Georgetown University Center on Education did a study and found out by 2020, 65% of the jobs nationwide will require some kind of post-secondary education. Now that doesn't mean a bachelor's degree necessarily. <coughs> it's bachelor's degree, it's associate's degree, it's te technical training. But it's 65% of the jobs. Um, and the level of post-secondary education, 33% needs college or associate, 23 bachelor's and 11% master's. And what they observed was that almost all states in the country have a current attainment level below the future required level. So we weren't achieving the goal. There are 4,500 institutions of higher education in the United States, whether two-year, four-year, public, private, or for-profit. 4,500, and yet we are not able to fill the needs of our workforce. Um, indeed, and this is why it gets into my institution, the increase in the workforce. Over the next 20 years, or ex up to 2020, the Hispanic population is the fastest growing mm -hmm. workforce in the United States. As a matter of fact, the data point is this. Of the 100 new jobs that are going to be created in the next five years, 75 of them will be filled by Hispanics. Simply because that's the youngest population in this country, and it's the population that's interested in going to higher education, mm -hmm. you know, getting a good job, ha making a change in their family, family uh, life. Um, and this shows you a little bit about, uh, in the year 2014, public schools in the United States became majority minority. In other words, 51% of the students in every classroom nationwide uh, are non-white. And that's been a big change for the country and probably why you read the things on the news that you read. I just think that, uh, personally, that the, the country's going through a, a new self-awareness of about who it is. I don't know whether this happened when all the you know, Italians came over and the Irish came over, whether we had great gnashing of teeth then, but uh, we seem to be going through the same thing. But at the same time, this is the workforce of the future. So I think that countries having to deal with it and say, okay, if this is the workforce, then what are we gonna do? Um, this was a nice data, the Pew Research Center said, the millennials uh, and seem to be the most educated, which is great, They're, we're moving along, we're, we're actually educating at a better pace than we were in the past. And then this is an interesting data point, and it's when I threatened to have everyone in my campus tattoo on their arm, and this is why. The blue line, the blue line are socioeconomic highest level of socioeconomic, and notice their graduation rate. They graduate at a higher pace than people either in the red line, which was the middle socioeconomic class, and the 17% and the 9%. But here's the data point that's not on here. That, blue, that green line and the purple line, the bottom two, actually represent 66% of the students that are going to be going to college over the next five or 10 years. Basically, put simply, the students that are going to be college over the next five to 10 years come from very modest means, and yet our workforce is going to require that they have college or higher, you know, college, some college or uh, bachelor's degree in order to fill the workforce. So we have a problem to solve. <laughs> By the way, they also come from very modest means. Um, my campus is a perfect example of that. The average family income of the students on my campus is $60,000. It's actually more like 45000 mm -hmm. which means they are immigrants or children of immigrants, and their degree is going to make a big difference in their family. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, we have the lovely problem <laughs> that other countries don't have, in that uh, the blue line is the cost of private education, the green is the cost of public education, and at the top you've seen what's happened to family incomes that's gone down. So families are less able to pay, and yet the cost of going to college has gotten to be more expensive. So the business model doesn't seem to be working in the United States. No surprise. <laughs> but we're working on it. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about, and this is important, uh, I, I serve on the NCAA Board of Governors. And one of the things we have observed, and we, we find this with our athletes who graduate, they will tell you, even if they went pro, what made a difference in their lifetime earnings was their college degree. So college degree students, and people who graduate from college will certainly make at least a million dollars more, well here it's 2.2 million dollars more than their peers who don't. So it's important to get the degree. 
So a little bit about my own institution. We're a very diverse institution. We, are, we do not have a majority. I um, am 50% Hispanic, but my Hispanic students are from every country in the hemisphere. Uh, I am 23% black, but the blacks come from the southern part of the state, southern part of the country. They moved up after slavery. Uh, and we have people that are from South America as well as from Africa. Um, and then I have Asian students who are from every country, China, Vietnam, uh, Japan, India, Pakistan. Uh, they're from everybody, which is fabulous. We started as a training school for teachers, but today we're a much more comprehensive institution. We have nursing, we have security studies, we have business, we have um, music, dance, and theater, arts. And here's the diversity. And this is the diversity of um, the city in which I work. We are the second in the country. Uh, mm. The diversity is um, pretty high. <laughs> the cultural diversity, we're number one. Uh, so we've done quite well, uh, and my campus re uh, reflects that, which is kind of cool. What it does, though, in the classroom, it makes the classroom a very interesting place to have a conversation. If you have ever had a classroom full of people from other countries, the way they think, every other person has a different way of, of approaching life, which mm -hmm. is fabulous. But you have to be patient enough to let that, ex that experience happen in the classroom. And by the way, this is true in the, in the, in the high schools here also in, in Jersey City. So let's talk a little bit about doing enrollment studies. Uh, this was a report from a long time ago. It said about 71% of the high schools and 51% of the post-secondary institutions permitted high school students to take college courses. Why is that important? When I taught high school back in the dark ages, uh, we were using, I don't think we even had calculators back then. That's how old ago it is. <laughs> um, we had students at my high school who would take a college level course. And they did that mostly to kind of get ahead. They wanted to get the college experience while they were in high school. You can either do it on the high school campus, you can have them drive to the college, or they can do it as an experiential uh, experience. Um, there were about 813,000 students taking this during the 12-month 12, 12 school year. This was in 2005, so that's a long time ago, and I'm certain that that number has increased significantly. In that, in that time, and I was involved in one of these, Bill and Melinda Gates put in a lot of money to create something called early colleges, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, early college high schools in just a minute. Um, there was a review of literature that found there wasn't a whole lot of evidence that students in high school who were enrolling in college contributed their ex college access or academic success. However, uh, in a, and I'll show in just a second, in another study it showed you kind of who took the courses. Uh, the important things that was important to doing a dual enrollment class was the authenticity of the experience. Was the instructor was the teacher actually someone who understand a college curriculum and how to teach from a college perspective? And then the integrated student supports. Did they get tutoring? Did they get men, you know, mentoring? Did they get help with, to get, be successful in the classroom? So this is a study that someone did from Oregon. The, they <laughs> realized if everybody that took the dual enrollment classes, 90% of the students passed the course. However, the people who were taking the courses, they were predominantly white, they were women, and they were uh, non-minority, and they were not low income. Translated, the graph I showed you earlier about the students who really need to be taking advantage of this weren't ne necessarily the students that were doing that. And that's something that, again, we want to try to address in our own school system. Uh, let's talk about dual education specifically in New Jersey and how that fits. There are high school students who will do apprenticeships. There's a company called um, Eastern Millwork, uh, it's actually a company from Germany, where students learn to do really high-end uh, millwork that you might see at, at Lincoln Center down in New York City. Um, they don't need to go to college, but they need to go and do this apprenticeship. And, and the students who graduate, finish, and get hired by Eastern Millwork usually want to go get a degree after that, which is a good thing. Um, summer research projects, we have high school students on my campus every summer working in the, in the science labs with my college faculty and the college students. So there's an integrated experience. In some instances, we've been able to turn this into college credit for them. In some instances not, they just want to have the experience of doing research. College level co courses taught in the high school, we do that in a number of ways. We have one school called Innovation High School where the students who finish high school could have finished as much as a two years towards our college. I have another school I work with, Arlington High School, where the same thing happened. If you point to a school down the street from us in Bayonne, uh, which is where the Longshoremen settled years and years ago, um, the students there predominantly just want to take business courses. So we give them some introductory business courses, sort of a flavor of what college is like. What this does for the students predominantly, though, is gives them a little bit of a leg up 
on courses that they can, can get transferred into the college so they don't have to take as many courses in college, or they can take other courses in college and end up with maybe two majors. Um, internships for high school students, that is happening more and more. Our uh, chamber will have internships for students as well as the mayor does that a lot. I actually have on my campus students who come from a Cristo Rey school. And this is the model there. None of the school, this is a private school, private Catholic school, and none of the students pay tuition. Mm -hmm. I have to pay to have a student to come to my campus one day a week. But that student gets a free tuition at this high school, four days of high level instruction, and then the fifth day they end up on my campus and we have them doing work in certain uh, departments. So when they finish high school, uh, they've worked and they're much more successful uh, in their college careers. Uh, and then prior learning assessments. We do this a lot. Uh, there, New Jersey has um, a method that they use through the American Council of Education where if you come to us with some experiences, we can measure if that counts towards college readiness or college career or college courses. So <coughs> the question I have for the dual enrollment, and the, the dual enrollment I'm thinking about here is simply, if I want to teach a college level class on, on high school, you know, and I also want to think about what that continuum is of learning from high school to college. What do we need to be teaching? What's the goal of the learning to be accomplished? How we learn to be more nimble, more integrated in our thinking, and, and what, so that we're helping to define what the future needs are, and then how do we accomplish that? I'll give you a simple example. So mathematics is my background, and I'll never forget the debate. So I taught AP Calculus, which was a college level course on my high school. I did the curriculum like they told me to. We integrated, students were engaged, I go to college, I'm teaching in a community college, we are having huge debates. Should we make sure every student can prove the fundamental theorem of calculus? Hmm. Should, they, should they prove that? And if they should, who should? Do, do, does the history major need to have that? Or does the engineer need to have it? And then, so what do you put in the curriculum that's relevant? And if you take it out, then what goes in its place? And what is today important? If you ask my business dean what he thinks is a critical math class, he would tell me statistics. Because he says that's far more relevant than some of the stuff, st stuff he calls it, you make me to take the students through in the calculus course. So I have to think about what's relevant and what's important. And the way I think we find it is we go to the industry and we ask, you know, what are the important skills that you need? What is it you want students to understand? Um, and the, the dumb analogy I give a lot is I was in high school long enough ago when I learned to take square root by hand. You might know how to do it. <laughs> 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 but it, it shows your age when you know, I remember, this, yeah, did you know how to do it? <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I think to myself, okay, what did it accomplish? So I, 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 I achieved some good thinking and I understand what a square root is but did I need to go through all that to understand that? And there were, were there other things I missed out on? At back the time, that was important. Um, so then how would you accomplish it? And the second thing I wanna talk about is like, what do we do to make sure that what happens in the high school when it happens at the college is seamless? Mm -hmm. So the goal of the learning, it's a continuum from primary to secondary to higher education, professional training and certification. I was involved in P20 initiative in Atlanta, the Atlanta, Georgia, where they wanted to take the math curriculum from kindergarten all the way through graduate school and say, okay, how do you do this so it's a continuum? So that the student walks out of the high school and when they take their first college level course, they're successful. They're not frustrated. So how do you make that happen, it, right? And it's about the level of thinking and about how you engage learning in the classroom. Um, the importance of understanding what needs to be taught, what pedagogies, they're most effective. Uh, I don't know necessarily that all my faculty nor all my teachers I taught with on the high school uh, are always using the best pedagogies, and how do I motivate them to do that? Uh, and what are the most effective for the student? What experience should be taught and to ensure maximum learning? Here's another interesting conundrum. So I have a lot of students from other countries, and I will, find, I will tell you that I have students coming from China. One of the hardest things I have for my students from China is forcing them to stand up and make a presentation. And I force them to do it without another Chinese person. <laughs> because I need for them to under, get out of their, un, their comfort zone. Because if they can, they'll be such an asset to some company somewhere, because mm -hmm. they have a much more global understanding. But that's just a small example of all the things we have to be attentive to when we teach. Uh, the pace of change of information, this is the other problem. I just texted the, my dean today and I said, you're gonna have to move faster than you're moving. <laughs> because 
curriculum is changing so fast. The needs of society are changing fast. So how do we learn to stay, keep the core that's important and then keep the other moving? Um, areas like financial technology, data science, bioinformatics, these were all things that when I was going to college didn't even exist. They're new and require more diverse thinking than before. We are finding more of our PhD uh, faculty that are coming to us, our new faculty, already have interdisciplinary doctorates, simply because what they want to do research in required two disciplines to kind of get the work done. Technical training, even technical training just to be much more accomplished use of technology and critical thinking skills. We find that with our community colleges and the work that they do uh, with aviation. Uh, then you can't forget that. Embedded is a rich diversity of humanities. Diverse learning environments create new opportunities for learning, uh, ways of thinking, ways of defining values. I just fun truly believe that this is critically important. And listening, learning to listen to other cultures and other ways of doing problem, I think is a critical thing. Um, and then, for students from the low kills, lower socioeconomic groups, it can be a life-changing experience, but they can also fall off the cliff tomorrow if you can't give them the right support. And for our students, a lot of it is financial. So, you're homeless, we're gonna put you in the residence hall and you're gonna work in the cafeteria because I don't want you to stop going to school. It's important to us. Uh, it's been an effective way, so what's the goal of learning? How does it affect dual education? Mm -hmm. It's an effective way to incorporate the goals of post-secondary education into the secondary experience. Let me talk just for a minute about the Bill and Melinda Gates School that they did at Queens College. So this is a, a school that starts in seventh grade. When you finish high school, you would have finished an associate's degree. I mean, here's what they made sure they did. They, <laughs> because that's the way the grant was written, they wanted the student body to be the bell curve of achievement. So I couldn't have everybody at the top end of the achievement. They wanted it spread out. I need to have people from special education all the way up to the brightest minds, and it needed to be diverse. Fortunately, Queens, the borough of Queens in New York City is very diverse. That was an easy thing to check off, and they did it through as a lottery. Um, the idea was this. You started them in eighth grade. Starting in ninth grade, they said, what college-level course could I possibly teach? They decided Spanish. They felt like teaching a foreign language would be a conceptual thing that students would be able to, and then you moved from there. Because they wanted to make sure when they finished high school that they had that two-year degree. And they were, they were highly successful, and well, the grant forced it. <laughs> but we have, we've started a, two others that we're working on with our local community college. But it really forces everybody to think about what's important, what are you teaching, and how are you teaching it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, See, I talked about the college campus apprenticeship. Anyway, you, all these things can help connect from the high school to the college into the, into the business world. Uh, you want to make sure the curriculum, I've talked a lot about that, and I've got to stop talking. Let me, these are the, go, go, uh, the modes of learning that we found out, the active learning. I was doing that myself a number of years ago. Problem-based learning is complicated to do. It is complicated to do, but done well done well. It's a very powerful learning experience. Socratic method, I had a colleague that that's how she taught. Everything was a question. Uh, flipped classrooms, guide on the side, not sage on the stage. Finally, this is where it's gonna happen. How do you train teachers for tomorrow? And then how do you keep them updated? And then finally, the doctoral granting institutions, are they teaching their doctoral students effective ways of teaching? Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> you keep your time well. You, you make a marvelous presentation, so I almost forgot about uh, my obligation. <laughs> so then we ask uh, Mina, yeah? Okay, that's uh, your turn to do that. You like ladies first, and then uh, gentlemen the last. Wife, very good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to participate in this uh, panel discussion. It's my great pleasure to be with you, and uh, uh, you are coming from education world, I'm coming from business world, I'm representative of Serbian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, but uh, we are a strong partner to our Ministry of Education in implementation of dual uh, model of uh, uh, VET at secondary level. I forgot to take. So I will now present you uh, how dual model, how we see dual model of education 
uh, on secondary level of education and what uh, Serbian Chamber of Commerce and Industry does in this story and uh, how this cooperation with Ministry of Education uh, see if, if, if how it, it works uh, in here in Serbia. So uh, you can see there are different, I think there are different uh, uh, definition of dual uh, model of VET, but uh, we in Serbia uh, see uh, dual model of VET uh, as a model of education that consists of uh, cooperation, strong cooperation between schools and companies. Uh, for us it means education on two places. Uh, it is possibility for students uh, to uh, get knowledge uh, to, to have theoretical classes and practical education at schools, uh, but to have work-based learning uh, uh, within uh, companies. Uh, so the, this work-based learning, it is uh, organized uh, as a process in which students acquire uh, competencies and develop skills uh, working by working within companies. Uh, for successful dual model of VET, we need uh, enough number of work-based learning places, enough number of companies to support us. Uh, we need also companies uh, to uh, be included, to be involved in development of curricula. We need also uh, minimum quality standards for licensing economic entities. We need uh, sources, funding sources, also, it is important for us to promote this education model to students, to uh, have flexible curricula and to have strong partnership with, with other stakeholders here in Serbia. Uh, what uh, does uh, uh, everything uh, on presented on this slide means? Uh, for this uh, number of work-based uh, learning places, it means uh, that uh, uh, it is necessary to have companies uh, willing to uh, offer places uh, for students to, to teach uh, at the working places. Uh, we also, but uh, if we want to have companies, it is necessary to include, to involve them in development of curricula. And we do that. We uh, involve them uh, in the first phase of development of curricula. It is called job profile. Uh, this is for secondary level of education. I'm not sure how much you are familiar with that process. In Serbia, there is institution that develop uh, curricula uh, and it is in charge of a standard of qualification and curricula. The first part of this standard of qualification uh, is called job profile and we uh, usually invite companies to define that first part, to define job profile because learning outcomes uh, depends on uh, well-developed job profile and for that we need companies and it is it means that if company uh, asks for uh, for well-educated and skilled labor force it is important uh, to them uh, to say what they need uh, what they need what they ask uh, from that labor force to know uh, for, for good working uh, within company. Mm -hmm. And also uh, these uh, minimum quality standards for licensing economic entities, it means that uh, we need to accredit uh, companies to, to check some conditions. It is necessary uh, for companies to uh, fulfill some conditions set, uh, set up by uh, law and dual education because it is uh, not uh, every uh, company in Serbia allowed to, to uh, be included in dual model of education, especially because of safety measures uh, uh, within companies. Uh, also, it is important to promote these profiles to young people because uh, if, we, uh, if we establish everything on a perfect way, uh, we won't have success if we uh, don't have interested students uh, to, be, to be enrolled and to be educated in this uh, dual profile. And also we need to have flexible curricula. It means to change uh, curricula uh, on, uh, um, on some relative, uh, relative uh, dynamics uh, in according to changes uh, in business sector. You can see that main building blocks of successful VET system in Serbia are company and vocational schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I would like to say, to inform you that uh, uh, we started to develop uh, this model of education in secondary level uh, in 2016. 
uh, but uh, with support of our partners from Germany, from Austria, from Switzerland. Uh, you know that today all these countries have very well developed uh, dual model of education at secondary level and we uh, use their experiences uh, uh, and also uh, include our uh, included our experiences, experiences in Serbia um, in, um, in from the past. Also, uh, uh, according to these uh, experiences and pilot projects, uh, we adopted the law on dual education at secondary level in 2017. And this year, based on uh, good, uh, uh, good results and good experiences at secondary level, this year we adopted law on dual studies in higher education. But uh, we have already achieved some results at uh, the level of secondary education, but uh, concerning this higher education, we still didn't start with any activity in this field, and it will be really a challenge for us to, to do something in that field. I think that maybe, uh, maybe we didn't have this law on dual education, dual study at uh, higher education because uh, faculties uh, already uh, have established some, uh, some connections, some links with companies and they used to work with companies. But, uh, and also students are, uh, are, mm, they are, they are older than 18 years old, which is important for Serbia uh, I at secondary level, I think for every country. Uh, when we are talking about secondary level, uh, you have younger students and you need to regulate uh, and to, uh, to uh, provide them with, uh, with uh, adequate level of uh, qualit qualitative uh, education. Uh, concerning these results that we achieved at level of secondary education, we uh, now implement uh, 35 uh, dual profile uh, as uh, three years or four years pro uh, profiles. We have around 6,000 students. What does it mean? I will say you that uh, uh, there are around 280,000 of students enrolled in at secondary level. Uh, 170,000 of them uh, go to uh, secondary vet. 110,000 go to gymnasium. It means that uh, uh, of uh, 170,000, uh, 6,000 students go to dual education, dual model of education. Mm -hmm. It is not a big percent, but it is for us uh, a really uh, a good success, uh, having in mind the fact that we started the uh, development of this model in 2016. We have support of around 800 companies, and we have 72 schools for VET. Uh, among these 800 companies, uh, SMEs have a uh, dominant uh, role. Mm -hmm. So you can see in this uh, slide uh, what uh, does it mean to have work-based learning uh, profiles. Uh, it means that uh, uh, our curricula consists of two parts. One, parts, one part is a general subject, the mm -hmm. other part is a vocational subject. Uh, we organize work-based learning for these uh, uh, vocational subjects. It means that we can uh, organize work-based learning uh, for at least 20%, uh, okay, I will <laughs> be fast, but no more than 80% of the vocational subject. So, uh, the nec next slide, uh, the next slide uh, uh, give, uh, give you gives, uh, gives you information about uh, some, some basic elements uh, uh, of uh, implementation of dual education, such as contracts between companies and uh, schools, contracts between companies and students. Uh, also, there is remuneration for <laughs> students engaged in dual education. Uh, here you can see a uh, role of uh, my chamber, why, why chamber is important for this uh, uh, model of uh, secondary vet. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we are the biggest association of companies here in Serbia and membership in our chamber is uh, obligatory. And also what is important, we, we here you can see the reason why we opted for this model of education because we see dual model of education as a way to revive our industrial product production to, uh, to, to um, maybe obtain higher reward for indirect investment to foster entrepreneurship and etc. 
uh, on this slide I present you uh, how many of students uh, go to, but I already told to you, how many yeah. of them go to, to secondary vet, to gymnasium and other schools. And these are, uh, this is slide that presents how, uh, with which, uh, which uh, profiles usually our students that enroll secondary vet uh, opt, uh, opt for. So I wanted to say thank something you. more <laughs> written in my paper, but since we don't have time, thank you very much thank for you. your attention. Very comprehensive. Very good. Okay, so the last one. Oh, oh yes, Chief Pantes. You want to sit down? Okay, good. No problem? Go ahead. Well, uh, can I get there? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mladen Stamenkovic from the University of Belgrade, Faculty of Economics. I'm currently the Vice Dean for Research, but uh, my primary role is a teacher and researcher, and uh, I want to, to talk about some issues that we actually started during the conversation we had before the start of this uh, session. And I will start with, um, with actually the report you named in your presentation, which is the GIS report. Uh, they say that this proportionate share of unemployed people has secondary vocational education. It's one of the first sentences GIS had why they started this uh, program and the whole thing. And it really is like that. The, as you will see, the, the unemployment is the worst within the secondary, people with secondary education. And that's why uh, it makes sense to, to make a link between industry and these people, especially, not with tertiary, much more secondary. Uh, many countries, uh, there is some research, you know, about this uh, topic and uh, we have this tracking. Uh, Germany is very specific because we will talk about Germany. Germany has a quite early tracking. They do it in fourth year, then they redo it in eighth year. <coughs> Our first tracking comes at eighth year uh, of uh, schooling with positive and negative consequences of it. Uh, we have the issue of inequality, which I would like to, to start as a topic. Um, I did some research, and this is how it should look like. So the Serbian idea of schooling, this would be some map. So after primary, you go to, to secondary uh, level of education, which would be gymnasium, which is a tertiary education track, and vocational school, which should go either to skill work on unemployment, and uh, this is where the big problem is. On the other hand, university goes, of course, this is lower professional work because you don't have any skills. There is a problem. But the idea of gymnasium is to go to university and then into these uh, people you talked about with higher income, and it's true in Western Balkans as well. So I wanted to talk about achievements. What uh, We have PISA test, and everybody talks about PISA. PISA is the... You know, PISA is the best um, OEC. I, I don't see anything better than PISA to see what students can do. And this is a research uh, I did several years ago. I wanted to, to look upon the achievements of Serbian students uh, regarding PISA, but we actually never did, uh, by their methodology, uh, we have never split students in Serbia via uh, educational profiles. Uh, so I did... Uh, this is part of my paper. Uh, of course, people from <coughs> gymnasiums, as, as it turned out to be, they were, they, had highly, they were highly dominant in scores. Mm -hmm. And then you have medical, artistic, economic, technical, and other uh, type of schools. Mm -hmm. uh, what was, if you go, and now we cannot see it, if you go by a geographical point, then you can see that Belgrade is much better than the other part of Serbia. Uh, I won't go into details, but clearly gymnasiums are the best, and people from uh, and Belgrade schools have uh, much better achievements than the rest of Serbia. So, the what PISA results can tell us that uh, different there is a different level of quality between tertiary education student and student going to vocational schools, which means the tracking does its job at eighth grade. People go to vocational education, which is Meaningful, and uh, what is interesting, the difference remains between all socioeconomic categories. 
So whether you follow the lowest uh, socioeconomic group, the, the difference between the abilities of students is good, so it means that tracking does its job in the eighth grade, which is a good thing to do and to know. Uh, when it comes to equality of opportunity, so uh, actually Germany is one of the largest, they have quite a big uh, difference between uh, socioeconomic groups, which happens because uh, lower income families push children towards uh, dual education and uh, they have this big desegregation which happens in Germany right now. Um, that's something like that happens in Serbia, but not such big effect, with not such big effect. In Sweden, for example, reform introduced comprehensive education uh, to, you know, increase both educational attainment, equity, blah, blah, blah. So when it comes to this, uh, I will like to get back to the main point. What's going on with the unemployment rate in this age group, which is rather important for us when we talk about dual education. So if you see, we are in top of Europe. So North Mac Macedonia now, Greece expectedly, and then here comes Serbia, Spain, and Montenegro. So we have a quite significant share of unemployed people in the group that is actually affected and can be affected by this dual education. Uh, unemployment rate uh, is very high in Western Balkans. I wanted to, to, to somehow, it's 24% compared to only 9.4 in EU. Then graduate unemployment, it's quite better. And this is important. There is significant difference between secondary education people and tertiary education people. And um, when you look at the, you know, in share of unemployed and employed, there is always this peak in Western Balkans when it comes to secondary education, which everything speaks in favor that we should focus on the, this dual education within secondary uh, schools. So when it comes to vocational education in uh, Western Balkans, uh, we have to mention, and especially for people not from here, that uh, Yugoslavia had uh, quite well-developed vocational education. And uh, the problem that, that, that we had very good industry and what happened is the 90s. And during the 90s, we, w during the wars, we lost this touch. We lost the industry and now it, it's difficult to get it back. And um, I think there is, you know, when people talk about dual education, you have to explain them that the root is actually existed. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole idea of that in Serbia was built upon some sort of dual education we had before. Whether it was school-based or work-based, that's a different story, but it existed before. Um, and uh, in the nowadays state, so structural change was driven by privatization, and we lost that link, and now there is this good idea to get it back. Uh, what's happening with transition to within the upper secondary education. Uh, there is research that shows that uh, we have to be careful. So improved labor market outcomes and better wage than uh, to people who do not progress to university, but that gets, of course, to people who come to university closes and the people with undergraduate degree have at the end better expected higher income. Uh, there is this research, I don't think I put it, uh, they did, uh, Professor William Barthel, who, who actually helped me quite a lot with presentation, there are a couple of his slides I borrowed, he did very interesting research uh, within these secondary educational students. He asked them a simple question, how did you get your job? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that the majority of the response was uh, via some connection with parents, family, or yes, it's relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows that it's, highly difficult for these people to avoid this um, obstacle of finding the job. And that's why building this bridge with industry makes sense, you know, to, 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 to lower this gap, because it's I amazing the difference with, uh, with people with undergraduate diploma. So they ask the same question and the difference of percentage uh, of the response, I got it because I had some connection it still exists, of course, on undergraduate level, 
because this is, you know, in Western Balkans, this is something which happened. Uh, it's amazing how, how the big the difference is. And uh, what's going on for returns to vocational education? Of course, uh, here the USA uh, showed that uh, higher returns to vocational track uh, than general tracks at school, although more recently this wage differential has been reversed and we we'll talk briefly about what's going on there and it's, uh, you know, the rise of uh, the cost of education and stuff like that causes it. Uh, of course, we, ha we have this research that uh, best education provides reasonable returns only in countries with well-developed bad systems and that's a one big topic for, uh, for Serbia because you have to have strong industry to support it and that's a question, that's why I think this small step, not only to, to push it to 60,000 students, but to have these baby steps with smaller, like GIS did, like you're doing, uh, makes sense much more than invoking it to tertiary education. We talked about that uh, before. Uh, for m I think it's much more meaningful to, 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 to focus on secondary education, not to raise it to, to tertiary education because uh, I, I'm not quite uh, happy with that idea because, uh, for example, at our university, at our faculty, we do it on our own. Uh, we don't need the uh, introduction of dual education for us to convince us that we have to have a connection with industry because modern universities should work that way. And country is not needed, uh, country, the, the government is not needed in that direction, but it's very much needed in the secondary education where the link between VET and industry is lost during the 90s. And I think that's the main issue you have to solve. We, we lost this connection. We had in Yugoslavia, we have really good connection uh, between wet and uh, industry. At the end, the uh, educational system in Western Balkans, uh, you know, powerful source of transmission of social exclusion. You have to, you know, uh, at the end, you have to realize that, you know, the issue of uh, equality, we never mentioned it. It's not an issue in America. In Europe, it's much more discussed than, you know, the equality of opportunities and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I might be wrong. That <laughs> <laughs> no way. Uh, um, the one country that applies the system is very well for the country that applies it. The whole world. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, I know, that's why. I, mean, I think in Europe, this is issue in Europe much more than it is in America. And uh, really, this is something you're working on and I think uh, you're on the right track and uh, you should continue it. Uh, when it comes to university reform, and maybe we should leave it for a discussion because you gave me uh, introduction to it. You know, you talked about, I was writing it because it was very interesting. Uh, you know, you, Opa, uh, you said quite relevant things. What is relevant in, you gave example of mathematics because you know, we keep forgetting that we're teaching people not for tomorrow, but for 20 years ahead. And, you know, imagine, look at the jobs now and go back in 1991, you know. They're all some programmers of stuff we didn't know existed there. Uh, we had uh, now a program, I don't know how it survived, but there was a computer and library that has a program from 1991. And I realized I wanted to, 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 to change this uh, thing in library, how we do it, because it's obviously outdated. We had a problem because they didn't have export button. You know, they had to, to manually write something because, you know, it was, it didn't exist. Windows didn't exist. We had this uh, incredible how change, uh, how the world changed in, in 20 you years. And Are you finishing that? Yeah, so yeah, uh, exactly. We, we can so start discussion already. Yeah, we can start discussion. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and everybody can jump in and inter okay. Okay. In because that's a good point. It, uh, I think, uh, and I will conclude now. The curriculum and all this. And exactly. All this and what do you teach? Because we don't know what will my daughter be in 20 <laughs> years. You know, she's okay. now nine months old, so I don't the really computers. know what what will she do. And I think the, 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 you mentioned it at the end, I think the answer for mathematics, because we are, <coughs> we are both, as I understood, I yeah, yeah, we are both uh, had mathematical background, but we are not doing mathematics anymore, neither me nor she. I think it's the problem solving based teaching in, right. in this way. And uh, 
you know, you don't teach them like algebra calculus because there is, you know, there is application that can solve an equation now. And I can just take a photo and I have the solution. And the problem is what to do with it and uh, how, to, how to use it in a problem solving context. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, is this yeah, wonderful, wonderful presentation.